Good afternoon, everybody. Everyone comes to AWS for different reasons. If you're in the retail space, um, you're aware of this thing called Cyber Monday. You're aware of the need to scale up and need a lot of compute during certain peaks of a retail season. Um, and so that's a great reason to use the cloud. If you're a new startup company, creating a new web company, uh, maybe you have no technical debt so whatsoever and you want to maintain your costs as low as possible as you get off the ground, that's another great reason to come to AWS and use the cloud. At a industrial company like mine, um, in an oil gas sector, we come to the cloud for a completely different reason. And so today I'm going to talk about how Chesapeake has been transforming our oil and gas production business through AWS and what it's like if you're not in the retail space and if you're not in the website business and if you're not in some of the more traditional, if you will, needs for cloud computing. Um, show of hands, how many of people are actually in either an oil and gas space or maybe a legacy type uh, line of business? Okay, so good, good amount of you. All right, so a lot of probably sympathetic uh, viewers in here, which is good. Anyway, just as way of introduction, my name is Blake uh, Blackwell. I am a principal data architect at Chesapeake. Um, I've been doing that role for about two years now, and I've been um, at Chesapeake for around 15 years and seen a lot of changes of, through how we do technology over that period of time. If you don't know, um, Chesapeake was established in 1989. And I bring that up because that means that we have 30 years of history of doing IT work, uh, which will become really important as we get more into why there's so much complexity and why we have so many challenges. Um, our business is focused primarily on the exploration and production of oil and gas. Uh, for those of you in the audience that aren't uh, aware of what that really means, uh, essentially we are trying to find oil and natural gas underground um, that often involves a lot of data, um, seismic data, uh, past previous um, operations that we have done. Um, and so we have a lot of data that we have to crunch to try to determine where the next productive area is going to be. Uh, and so that's been a long running challenge for us and, and means that we've always been reliant upon data and trying to use data to make intelligent decisions about how to get oil and gas out of the ground. We can't see it uh, with our naked eye. We have to rely on um, uh, seismic or rely on past results to predict hopefully future outcomes. Um, and then we're also dealing with production. So once we have discovered that gas, how do we continue to optimize that production, make sure that wells aren't shut in for a certain period of time, and keep that going um, so that we don't lose that revenue um, out of the ground. Now, if any of you know about the oil and gas industry, we are heavily cyclical. Um, we are reliant upon commodity prices. So when oil prices and gas prices are up, then we are up. Uh, when oil and gas prices are down, then we are down. Uh, this has a huge impact on our investment, both in our employee base, our technology stack, and how we apply all of these things together. In fact, here's a good slide that actually shows, and I'm not really always excited about how these lines look here, but the, but the fact that commodity price equates to our stock price. So again, you'll notice um, that oil there is represented in the yellow, and as that yellow line goes up, our stock price goes up. Um, and then as that line goes down, our stock price goes down. There's nothing more we can really do except sell at that price that the market is reflecting and get that value. So at some points, it's at $100 and we're doing okay. At other points, it's at $30 and we're not doing good at all. Um, this has a huge impact on, on what we do. As you can imagine, as the commodity price decreases, our operations decrease. This is really important because it means how many rigs are we actually going to drill at a given period of time. 
So we're not dealing with, I have a predictable period at, say, Christmas season that I know that this is going to be a high demand of computing resources. We are dealing with the fact that at any given point, any given quarter, that commodity price could go up, could go down. We may drill more rigs or we may have less rigs. Um, next year, Chesapeake has already announced that we're going to have a significant decrease in the amount of rigs that we're going to have. Um, so that is going to affect what we're going to do. This also impacts, the harsh reality is that it also has an impact on the number of employees that we have. That is true both out in the operations side of it, and it's true in the IT space as well. So we are deeply impacted when that commodity price goes down of what we can do and invest in our technology. As you can imagine, that creates a lot of unnatural technical debt because we have lost key members that know certain things about what we've done in the past and why we did it in the past. Now, one of the strange corollaries is that of course, our workloads increase per employee. So if we have fewer IT employees, we didn't suddenly get rid of the 500 applications that were sustaining our business at 50 drilling rigs. We still have the exact same number of applications to maintain. Our application and data footprint often increases as well. Because as we lose people, we then get into more and more automation scenarios. We have to worry about um, trying to take some of that workload that people were maybe doing manually and have more integrations or have more reports or have more analysis on what we are doing. And again, our technical debt is increasing this whole time because during that period of commodity price being low, um, we are not doing a lot technically. We are maintaining status quo, trying to keep the lights on to wait for that next commodity price sweep so that we can do more investment in technology. This creates a real challenge for us in the technical space and is, is something that is just a reality of being in a cyclical business that is commodities. Now this next slide gives kind of the long running history of what we've been doing at Chesapeake in IT. I like to call the first period from roughly 1989 to 2003 the period of Excel rules the world. Um, this is when everybody basically tracked everything through an Excel application. One, because we were a small business, and two, because we didn't necessarily know better. Um, and, and, you know, we're dealing with things through email, networks and file shares, and maybe a few degree of master systems. And that's primarily the lifeblood of IT is to keep those things up. And then in Chesapeake's biggest heyday, when we really, really were uh, exploding, I call it the application explosion phase. And this was roughly between 2004 and 2012. And this is where we realized we don't need Excel sheets. We need an application for everything. And so we created application after application after application. We created client apps and we created internal web applications. Now, as I said, those applications haven't disappeared from our portfolio. We've done a little bit of app rationalization, but in general, when we decided that we needed 40 land applications, we still have roughly 40 land applications that we're maintaining with now an employee count of 200 instead of the employee count of, say, 500 in the IT space. So, very challenging. Of course, during this time, we start realizing that things like enterprise data and BI is really important. And so we create our first data warehouse. Uh, like most companies, not in the cloud at the time, we leverage Oracle uh, to build that data warehouse. And so we start building an on-prem data warehouse that has been very, very successful and is still running today. We also get into more and more data governance. We need to have quality data to start doing these things. And we get into data validation exercises around that data. And so that next period is really focusing on Okay, we've got all these applications, but we need to make sense of it in some sort of combined, aggregated way. Then we get into the period of on-premise innovation. And this is the period that we've been living in for probably the last four or five years. Uh, this is the concepts that everybody is now familiar with, which is you have a big data environment. Um, you, ha you start practicing things like Agile and start practicing things like DevOps, but you're doing it all on-prem. 
Um, we had a really great Hadoop environment that we were able to support. We were able to stitch together a lot of kind of recycled hardware. Again, remember commodity prices are, are down during some of these years. And so we were able to stitch some of this hardware together and make a Hadoop environment and make it succeed. And now finally, we are into this period, what I call the cloud innovation period, where we are starting to adopt more and more cloud practices. We start having cloud warehouses. We start doing ML at scale. And we're starting to do IoT at scale. So that's the period that we are in today and the period that I want to talk more about. So what are some of these technology and business design constraints that being in a cyclical business has? Well, one is we have a legacy footprint. We get into situations, because of our commodity price being down, where we have out-of-date hardware. In fact, we just have completed a large uh, migration of a lot of that legacy hardware to modern hardware um, because for periods of years we didn't have the investment and we just said, well, we'll just let those servers run a little bit longer. The same is true with our out-of-date software. Um, we let um, our licenses that we could do with some sort of perpetual license just keep going um, and not actually do upgrades. So you can imagine the technical debt that this creates. As we start to think about the cloud, we now find out that things like our reporting software doesn't necessarily work with modern cloud data warehouses. That creates a challenge for us. We realize that our scheduling software um, that we had in the past doesn't necessarily integrate with modern, uh, modern uh, tooling in the cloud. And so we have to start thinking about all these things as we become more of a cloud-centric company. We also have a limited budget and IT staff. Um, so we're not doing as much as far as refreshing kind of our understanding of techniques and approaches. And so we're stuck with the idea that an application belongs on an application server and that's how you build it. You know, we still think in terms of interior type architectures where we're used to the traditional database, used to the traditional web server, and that's how we think about life. And then there's just the technical debt. It is very hard to modernize yourself and go to the cloud when you have half the staff that you used to have and all the complexity, and you're asked to also move to the cloud at the same time. You're spending 50, 60% of your day maintaining the old stuff that you wrote um, and not moving it forward. So these are a lot of challenges. Now the other thing, because we are not a web company, because we're not in some retail company, we are not necessarily in IT viewed as adding a lot of value. The developers are not the people that create the cash flow in the organization, um, as it can happen in a lot of companies. Uh, it's the geologists, you know, it's the production engineers, it's the reservoir engineers. They're the people that make the money. They're the people that get the money and the types of investments to do new things. And so we have to flip the idea that IT is just a cost center to we are actually a value center. Um, that we are actually doing way more than we did back in the period of just maintaining uh, Office and Outlook and Excel. And that we are actually providing value through new innovative solutions that can actually have an impact on the bottom line. That is a change culturally and holistically that is a big part of the digital transformation that is hard to get. Because a lot of our leadership comes from more of those engineering or geological backgrounds and understands that side of the business. And so it's not as native as being part of a web-centric company where they understand technology from the get-go, from the top down. So what are the stages of Chesapeake's cloud journey? I present this slide because I think it's important to see the stages that we went through and maybe how you can accelerate it. It's kind of like the five stages of grief. You know, if you know you're going through them, maybe you can go a little bit faster. Um, so our first stage back in 2016 was the stage of no. I remember having a lot of kind of discussions of, hey, you know, we should do this cloud thing. I think it's really going to help. It's going to simplify things. And the answer was pretty much no. And from what I could tell, there were two reasons for that. First, 
was the premise that it was a very high cost environment. Now, why was it a high cost environment? I think there was a lot of legitimacy to this argument and can even still be at times. When you're dealing with third party applications that you have no control over, when you're dealing with some of these in tier legacy architectures, um, moving a server from your on-prem data center, which you've already paid to, to the cloud doesn't necessarily translate. In fact, we did that with our Hadoop environment. We moved it out to the cloud and we realized we were burning through cash because we were treating it the same way that we had always treated things on-prem, which is storage is cheap, network is cheap, compute is cheap, all those things are cheap and not rethinking what the cloud was actually doing for us. The other part um, is the fact that we had low trust in the cloud. We like our firewall. It's safe, it's comforting, it protects us from all things bad outside in the world. It's because we don't necessarily have internalized new modern approaches to cloud security. We don't necessarily know how to deal with some of the changes that have happened um, some of the ideas of least privilege, the idea that you don't have um, some of the open gaping holes that you didn't have to worry about when you had everything protected under the firewall, and that you have to think about security in a whole new way. And so those two reasons, I think, kind of led to why we said no in 2016. Then we get into the maybe stage. And this is when your CIO says, okay, why don't you go put three of your wimpiest applications out into the cloud? Right? I mean, it's pretty safe, there's going to be no worries, the data leakage of these three kind of wimpy things that don't do anything, not a big deal, uh, we can learn some things, and so that is what we do for 2017. Then we get into what I call, and I've got some of my fellow Chesapeake people here, the ineffective stage, and it's not that we were fully ineffective, but this is when you really start to learn what the cloud is about. Um, and so you have to start thinking, what do I know and what do I don't know? And you just kind of keep getting your head just churned over and over as you go through some of these new patterns of thinking. And so we go through a stage of, you know what we should do? We should just lift and shift everything. That, that's the right approach. Um, and so you start going down that path and you start saying, okay, well, we're going to lift and shift everything out into the cloud. A and then you start realizing that is very problematic especially when you have limited control over your application space. Uh, not all these, one, we're not maintaining five applications that we can like slowly migrate into say a microservices pattern. We're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of applications that maybe we split over um, you know, 50 database servers and 200 application servers, large amounts of things that would have to actually move. We also, are getting into this nature of starting to trust SaaS and PaaS. But, you know, it's still minimal. We don't know exactly what's an appropriate SaaS application and what's not an appropriate SaaS application. You know, is it okay to have SAP do some of our employee data in a SaaS application? Well, you know, once you cross that boundary, you can start crossing new boundaries of saying, okay, well, if I'm gonna trust them on that part of the data, can I trust um, another type of technology, whether it be Redshift, Snowflake, or others, with more and more of our data? Once you cross that boundary, you start realizing, oh, okay, uh, there are certain things I have to look at when evaluating a SaaS or PaaS technology to say that I trust them, they are actually secure if I adhere to these boundaries, and you start having a growing comfort level. And so that's what I mean by an ineffective stage, is we're learning these things and growing in our comfort. And that brings us into today, 2019, where we become more and more effective. We now know what to look for when we evaluate cloud technologies. We know we don't want to, say, run our Hadoop ecosystem 24-7 with 15 nodes that are only running at 10% utilization. We realize that's ineffective. We want to look for technologies that take advantage of things like elastic compute, take advantage of things like cheap storage and S3. Um, and are strategic about SaaS and PaaS. The other thing that has happened, uh, and, and this is more kind of a note to ourselves at Chesapeake, is that the IT world has changed. For the longest time, as I talked about that application explosion, that's what we dealt with. 
Um, we knew how to write applications. We could build a lot of applications. But the thing that's happened, and we keep seeing it over and over in today's keynote and other places, which is data has become the new oil, which of course resonates with us as an oil company. Uh, we can get that kind of concept. But everything now is about data, which means we have to make data more key to our strategy and make more and more of our staff data-centric type individuals. So instead of just writing applications, now we've got to deal more with integrations, or we've got to deal more with warehousing, or we've got to deal more with ML scenarios, and we've got to start t changing people's skill sets to that type of thing instead of just being able to write a web application or a client application. The other thing is that it is now a Linux-based world. When I was at uh, Chesapeake at first, there was only two guys that knew about Linux. One of them is actually sitting in this room. And they were the Linux people, and they ran every Linux thing in the company, and the rest of us were only comfortable on Windows servers, right? So we were all scared of an environment where Linux becomes so centric. Now, more and more of us have to become Linux people. We have to grow comfortable with things other than Windows and Microsoft-type environments. The next point is really kind of surprising to me, which is that code is everywhere. There was a time where we thought IDEs were going to save every situation and make all of our lives easy, and that the development world was just going to go away. If anything, it's kind of gone the other direction, which is there is more and more code. Infrastructure is now code. Um, everything you do as a DevOps practice is code. Uh, of course, there's still the art of development. Even machine learning and all those aspects, as, as automated and uh, as we're getting, even that is heavy, heavy code. The data world has become more code. It used to be you just had these GUIs and you threw a BI tool on it and you were done. Now, uh, even our BI guys write R and Python code to do stuff. That is the nature of the world that we now live in. Of course, DevSecOps is the new norm. All of us are now are becoming more and more comfortable with the fact that we should do everything in an automated, testable fashion. Um, and that becomes a challenge because that is a discipline that maybe we're not used to. Uh, for the longest time, we like to put tickets in our change management system that said task by task, copy or do on this screen or whatever. And now we're getting into the fact that we can rethink how we redeploy just about everything. And the other thing for a company like Chesapeake is that open source abounds, and that's challenging. Because what do we like to do? We like to buy software from people that we had a relationship with that we could be established. But as open source starts abounding, we have to trust people with our libraries, um, with code bases, with other things, as we start realizing that we can't completely control the ecosystem just through vendor management. Uh, there's so much good stuff out there in the world that's through open source um, that, we, that we can use. Next, I want to go through strategies of a transformation um, that hopefully uh, resonate with you and, and perhaps you can use as well. The first was our initial strategy, which is lift and shift. Um, this is an overly simplified diagram of what it looked like uh, for, for us to think about a lift and shift strategy. Uh, you see on here two applications. You see that you have uh, needs like scheduling, ETL servers, a data warehouse, data marts, um, and, and that these things are tied together. What you quickly realize is that if you move one part, you're going to have to move another part. And then you're going to have to move this part and another part with that. Um, and so all of these things become a tangled web that you have to figure out how you're going to solve it. Uh, we have one example where we moved the database server and we didn't move the application server. Uh, it turns out something that we never cared about on-prem was that application was really, really chatty. You notice that when your AWS environment is out here on North Virginia and we're still in Oklahoma City and our users are starting to wonder why performance has decreased. Well, it's because we never thought about what our great network guys were doing behind the scenes of having a high throughput bandwidth that we were always taking advantage of. 
We never realized that application was chatty because we never even really needed to think about that type of question. Um, now we know that that is actually there and that that is a problem for us. So, so you start realizing these things as you get into lift and shift and you realize how coupled all of these things are and how tough it is to really move something that you have very little control over the application architecture. So you have tightly coupled integrations. You have dependencies everywhere. You have latency. Again, my networking friends like to tell me that you cannot cheat the speed of light. It is always going to be the same speed from Oklahoma City to North Virginia, and that's just what it is. Um, I try to tell them that's not true, and they, they just you know, say that that is definitely true. So, um, and of course, we have a lot of legacy software. Um, the people who wrote our well master system are, you know, somewhere on their own cloud journey. I think they'll be there in like seven or eight years, you know. So, I mean, it's the challenge of the fact that like it takes time to get those companies up to speed. Um, even some of the new technologies that we bring in still seem to be on some of the older style type architectures. Uh, microservices is a thing that a lot of the West Coast companies do, but maybe um, more of the companies that are in some of the oil and gas space are still grappling with. Or maybe some of the challenges that, say, our seismic data tools deal with are not ready and not really quite available to do that type of problem um, where, where they have that approach. The other thing that this, and this is key, is it creates limited business value. My friends in geology, land, reservoir engineering, they don't care whether that server sits in AWS. They don't care whether that server sits here on our own on-prem data center. Because they're not going to know, unless I introduce something like that data latency problem, that that is a thing. We are not adding necessarily new business value by shifting people to the cloud on an AWS server versus our own on-prem data center. Um, it might yield some IT benefits, it might reduce a little bit of our own complexity, but from their perspective, if that's all we did for two years, they would not think that we added any new value to their lives because we haven't added any new features, we haven't added any new improvements or enhancements. Um, so you really gotta be wary about those things because at the end of the day, if you're not a development shop and you are seen as a cost center, it is how do you add actual business value. So this next strategy is one that I think can add more business value. And this is what I call the data replication and integration strategy. So the two main boxes you see is our CHK data center. Now remember it's over here in Oklahoma City. And our AWS cloud environment is over here in uh, North Virginia. And so instead of moving all of those applications out to AWS, what we're going to do first is we're going to move all of that data over to AWS. Because by moving all that data over to AWS, I can now do new and interesting things. Uh, I can do more machine learning than I ever could. Uh, I could run uh, cloud data warehouses like I've never been able to do. And so we use a technology, uh, on here I have listed HBR, that is basically a data replication technology. So we're gonna move from this idea that we're gonna do truncated loads every night to we're going to do real-time replication over the transaction log of that database to get that data there as quickly as possible. Which is great, your customers love it. And now instead of nightly refreshes, they are seeing data changes within a few minutes. Um, and so, uh, our networking guy loves it because it doesn't flood the pipe. Um, there's an initial load process that is you know, somewhat um, heavy, but after that, it's just the transactions that are occurring. And so we realized that, okay, we can actually yield a lot of value by moving that data and not necessarily moving that application. The other thing that we realized is we can deal with integrations better. I talked about how tightly coupled everything was. Um, and that tight coupling is based off of probably four or five different integrations approaches in the past. Um, and so now we start looking at how can we simplify that? When we do get into the space of we're going to move these applications, what approaches can we do that will better allow us to actually lift and shift that application 
Well, the first thing we can do is we can start simplifying a lot of those integrations and move that type of stuff forward as well. So what does this create for us? It creates loosely coupled integrations. So now we can deal with integrations better in the future. That yields simplified dependencies. It decreases the latency because now we're no longer dealing with any latency between our ML algorithms and our data. It's already in the cloud that we want to do the work. Um, and it provides modern software. We're dealing with more and more uh, cloud-based technologies at th this point. The other thing that it yields is now we're actually doing things the business wants. We now have business value. Machine learning can find some type of problem out for them um, and yield better production volumes uh, through, through machine learning. Uh, we can give people more power to do things on cloud data warehouses because now I'm no longer worried about the Oracle environment that I've had for 10 years and worrying about how much capacity I have on that thing. Uh, I now can deal with elastic type query questions that people are throwing against our data warehouse environment. All these things are good. Some best practices here is replication and integration. Use the right tool for the right job. Um, don't look at something like a classic truncate and load type tool. Look at a tool that actually can bring that data over as lightweight as possible. Continue to use DevSecOps. Um, you're in the cloud now. It's going to be a challenge at first. It may even take a little bit more time to set up. But try to do DevSecOps whenever you start bringing these things over. Don't bring your legacy approaches into the cloud. Start modernizing how you do these things, because the cloud will allow you to do more things through a CLI or an API than you've ever been able to do in the past. And then again, the key for us has been to centralize our data for analytics. If we can centralize our data, um, our customers can do new things in the cloud that they couldn't do before. One of the key complaints that I get as a data architect is it is hard to get to our data. Um, and, and what they don't know that they mean is a lot of the times in the past, we wouldn't let them get to our data because I couldn't trust them to write a decent SQL query that might bring my Oracle data warehouse down, right? Now we can start opening that up for them because we can give them safe compute spaces that they can do their types of queries in without bringing the rest of, say, the enterprise reporting layer down. So very good things that we can now take advantage of. The next thing is start being successful with SaaS and PaaS and best of breed technologies. Um, one of the things that we realized we needed as we started modernizing was we realized we needed a scheduler um, that could actually talk across both of these environments. So we look for companies like BMC um, that has a product with Control-M that does native integration to these technologies. We have several AWS batch jobs that we run. Well, instead of having to wire up through the CLI how to do AWS batch and look for errors and all of that type of stuff, we leverage out of the gate BMC's control M tied to AWS batch. Same with Lambda functions. Um, we don't have to worry about those things. If we want to drop off files to S3, all those things, when you buy a technology that realizes that it can take advantage of the cloud, you can use that technology instead of having to build your own. So look for those types of companies. Um, other technologies that we use is Databricks and Snowflake. Uh, one of the things we realize is that we have um, a limited technology staff. And there are things that are really, really cool, uh, like Dockerization, Kubernetes, all of those things. And you could do that. And you should do that if you're a big software company. Now, if a company like Snowflake wants to come along and abstract us from that concept, all the better, right? So we start looking for companies that are natively taking advantage of the cloud and allowing us to do things like having a Dockerized cloud warehouse with us abstracted from that concept altogether. If I want a bigger warehouse, I run a SQL command that changes it to a larger warehouse, automatically I get more machines. Great, all I did was write a SQL statement. I didn't learn anything about Kubernetes. So again, Look for those technologies that take advantage of some of that stuff. And you may run into situations that those technologies are great and you need them, um, but sometimes, especially when you're dealing with 
commodity prices in a crunch, look for companies that also abstract you away from some of the problem that you don't necessarily want to deal with. So what does this create? Well, one, it starts creating a serverless architecture. It gets us to the cloud patterns that we actually want to be in. Um, and that allows us also to have simplified licensing. I don't know how many people next year uh, with a reduced rig count are going to run the same type of queries that I predicted that I would have in my Hadoop environment four years ago when I built it. But now I don't have to worry about it because I can take advantage of, say, a smaller warehouse size with licensing to boot based off of that and save the company money as we are going to go through a time where we reduce our capital spend. Great. Um, those are all good things. Continue to do things like isolate compute and centralize storage. If I can do that, I can make new patterns for my customers where they can deal with querying various tools, various technologies without impacting, say, the Oracle data warehouses of the past. And again, start moving towards practices like data ops. Everything's got to have an ops at it. Data especially is the, the newest one to have an ops at it. Leverage technologies like DBT where you can do things like testing. You can do things like Git check-ins and automated deployments through your DevOps pipelines. This creates even faster business value. And the reason why it creates faster business value is now not everything is a centralized IT function. Now we can start getting into these concepts which we've talked about forever but been very hesitant to do, like self-service for people in the BI and analytics workspace. Because we can corner off a part of the world for them to have meaningful impacts, to do more interesting work without necessarily bringing down our stable workloads at the same time. Some best practices here. It is challenging to stitch together disparate systems. The nature of the cloud is that every tool has its purpose and function, but you're going to have to bring them all together. In, in architecture, you have this concept of cross-cutting concerns. And three of the big cross-cutting concerns that I see is one, scheduling. You're not going to get away from batch workloads overnight. That's still going to be a thing for a long time. So look for an enterprise scheduler like BMC's Control M that can bring those things together um, across both your on-prem data center, where it's still going to exist for quite a while, and your cloud-based environment, and move that forward. Other technologies that we use, like MuleSoft for enterprise integrations. Uh, again, we could create API gateways and all these types of things, or we could leverage a company like MuleSoft to simplify a lot of that workflow. And the biggest thing I think that you have to do, and this is the, the challenge and, and hardest thing when you're on support or on call, is get better logging across all of those environments. Use a tool like Splunk to bring together disparate logs and start tying that data together so that you can see problems, predict problems, or understand what's going across all of these various systems. Some best practices around technology selection. A legacy architecture is still an IaaS architecture. I, we're, we're dealing with a technology right now which is just classic IaaS architecture. What did they ask for? They asked for a SQL server, and they asked for a web server, and another web server for a web service. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us where their technology stack is still today, right? Um, and that can be a warning sign that they are not necessarily modernizing in a way that will deal with the problems of the future for you. Um, that you're going to still be stuck in some of those old licensing models as well. You're always going to be on the hook for some sort of upfront licensing. So look for those technologies. Um, and, then, and then try to stay away as much as you can. Uh, the other thing that I always look for is if they're heavily GUI based, you know they haven't adopted either a decent CLI or a decent API, uh, REST API that you can start doing with things. That is another warning sign that you're going to be stuck in the patterns of the past of asking people to click buttons and deploy things and kind of a regimented a factor that you don't want to be in and you can't implement things like DevSecOps practices. Um, the other thing that I think is key is if they are a closed system and they lack integration with a lot of other technologies, that is a warning sign. 
I think one of the bragging rights of a lot of these modern companies is how many technologies they actually integrate with. And when you see something like a MuleSoft um, that has tons and tons of integrations or a technology like Control-M that has tons and tons of integrations, that's what you want to look for because you can say, oh, okay, I can actually leverage that to tie my disparate ecosystem together. What is a modern architecture? Best thing possible is we don't want to maintain these applications anymore. So if it's SaaS or PaaS, and we are not maintaining it um, as far as knowing about the underlying server implementation and all that, that is good news. So look for those kind of things. Now one kind of note about that is it's not really for free. Uh, we we kind of joke on the operations team that like, what is SaaS? Uh, I still seem to be doing a lot of things. Um, that's true, but you're not doing all the things that you used to do as far as provisioning up front and thinking about what servers and that type of environment. You're dealing with more of kind of how do I cross security boundaries? How do I set up roles? And a lot of times you're also starting to get into a new problem, which is you're solving the business architecture and not so much the technology architecture that you used to resolve. Uh, look for consumption licensing. Consumption licensing is key. Uh, again, we're a cyclical industry. That's why we think about these problems is that we have to deal with that. Uh, obviously look for DevSecOps support. Make sure they have a CLI, make sure they have an API. All the better if everything can be done with those types of technologies. Uh, and make sure that it integrates with others. Some exciting possibilities of how we're going to be able to produce um, better data uh, out in the field, which is going to help our bottom line and help us go from a cost center to a value center. Our current IoT estate looks like this. And the thing about uh, technology and oil and gas space is like, We've been doing IoT for a long time. Uh, we have SCADA systems that have been out there forever. Now, uh, you know, when you set up a well, you don't upgrade that SCADA system like every year. Uh, it, what you have is basically what is out there from 20 years ago, which creates kind of all this kind of uh, conglomerated stuff. And so what we do is we take the data from there and then we put it back to Oklahoma City and then like I said, we're gonna do something cool with it so we're gonna have to move it out to AWS. Well, people don't like necessarily that double hop, whether they know it or not, they tell us, well, we wanna know about that change in the field within a few minutes. Um, so we've gotta resolve that problem. Uh, you know, these technologies are old, so we do legacy pool mechanisms on an ODBC driver. That's really cool and fun, but not. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of problems there that we have to deal with. What we can do is we can change all of that with more AWS native type of approaches. We can send that di data directly to AWS. We can collect even more data by doing edge type collection. So one of our problems is we have network constraints out in the field. Um, and so we can only send so much data uh, through that network. And that often means that we only collect points at once every 15 minutes, some points once every five minutes or a minute, which means we don't have that much insight. Well, I can't change necessarily that old SCADA system, but I can put a decent Raspberry Pi style device out there. That device actually has a somewhat decent drive that I can collect data on. Um, and I can then trickle that data back into our AWS data center. I can do edge type detection and push those events through MQTT out to AWS IoT analytics and get data and events out to people a whole lot faster and have brand new insights. I also don't have to do this kind of weird mechanism where I'm going from um, uh, the field to Oklahoma City out to AWS. I can start just sending that data more directly to AWS. So that's one of the technologies that we've been playing with and are really excited about, I think, over time to see that improve. We also have started working with some of our vendors on similar types of approaches, where in the past they would send us data to our data center for us to do something with it. And now they're asking, how can we more directly integrate with AWS um, and push data to, say, your S3 bucket or your MQTT um, subscription? So good stuff there. What are some opportunities? There is a lot of business value in this stuff. And again, the thing that CEOs love or people that make actual decisions is 
providing true business value. Some things that we've already started to do is we've done hydrate detection. Um, you know, it gets cold out there in the winter time, which means the pipes freeze, which means the oil and the gas doesn't flow. Uh, if you can detect that type of thing early, that means that you can get that production out and continue to make money. So looking at some of this IoT data, detecting these anomalies and acting on them in a timely fashion instead of kind of a reactive fashion uh, can save and, and we anticipate that we'll have at least $9 million uh, over the next year from that type of solution. Uh, we also have an analytics based field alerting uh, system. So again, how do we increase that production? Well, we make sure that our wells don't shut in. How do we do that? We monitor our IoT data and we send this out through mobile um, alerts to people's uh, dashboard and instead of them kind of going through this routine every day of checking the same wells, we send them out to the well that has the most economic value um, to, to get um, action on that shut-in well or a well that is going to have a negative impact uh, if we don't take action quickly. And the other good thing from kind of a nerd uh, data architect solution is we can start consolidating things. Uh, we can take that Oracle data warehouse, we can take that Hadoop environment, um, and we can start bringing it together into a cloud data platform uh, and, and simplify our over our architecture, which again allows us to have more business value. Our technology op opportunities, we're going to continue over time, and I think this is going to be one of those things that we'll be doing for years, to simplify our IoT and machine learning strategy as we get better with the cloud. Um, we're going to not worry so much about data capture. We're going to capture more and more data. I always like to tell people, I don't worry about data cost. Data is cheap. Uh, you know, it's just cheap in AWS to put things in AWS or to kind of let it age out into Glacier. Don't worry about those types of things. Worry about whether or not your algorithms are, are efficient and how much com computation you're paying for. Uh, the other thing I find really great is that we're dealing more with business value architecture over technology architecture. For so long in my career, I solved only technology problems, thinking about how to stitch all these things together, thinking about what I needed to ask from our operations team, and now I'm starting to think more and more about how I design things for the business. And that's really great, and it frees us up to solve business value problems over just trying to stand up things and make them all talk. We're always going to be a cyclical based company, which means that we're going to have to continue to deal with the cyclical based technology strategy. What that means is you look for things like things that can spin up and spin down, things that have a variable licensing strategy based off of how much you're doing, um, and things that will actually provide business value for you in the future. At this point, uh, I want to open it up to questions. Uh, I think someone might be able to pass a mic around if anyone has a question. If you have any questions, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll come over for you. Yes. Come on right up. Yeah, so that's a great story. So. You talked about the transformation of the technology. I mean, how did you get the people buying? The culture is also a big part of it when you're going through this journey. So what are some of the things you did there? Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, that's an ongoing journey. Uh, I think people uh, come on at various phases. Um, and I think different people have different interests, right? So, um, you know, a, a couple of our Hadoop admins are actually here in the room. Hadoop was an incredibly complex platform. Um, and so anything you can do to say that you're simplifying that type of ecosystem uh, talks to the operations side of your operation engineers or site reliability engineers. From a business standpoint, um, one of the things we've done is I talked about kind of some of the new business value and opening up capabilities. We've allowed people there to write their own queries and build their own analytics and we've kind of taken some of the power users and said, hey, look at this tool. They then go talk about that to their higher ups. Um, and so some of it's this grassroots situation. It's nice if you can have kind of top down all the way, but a lot of times you've also got to do it from like a grassroots approach of trying to sell 
key individuals within the company. And then other things like our field analytics service, we had some oh, innovation days, if you will, where we had cross-disciplinary teams come. You solve that, and then you get out an MVP fairly quickly. Uh, and over time, people start realizing how that can change their operations and day to day. Um, so it's just kind of through a variety of methods that we that we get there. And uh, not quite frankly, it'll take you know more more years to fully fully get it going. Thank you, Blake. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, I know everybody understands what you, the pains you had to go through to get to this point in your journey. So one question is, you mentioned about replication you're doing with HVR right now. So are you doing replication of the current warehouse to the cloud warehouse? Are you actually getting the, the source systems directly replicated yep. into the cloud? Great question. Uh, so uh, we take all of the source systems. Um, you, you could, uh, you got a lot of enterprise models that say you'd worry about. Um, and, and so that would be one approach, but the, the problem with say our enterprise models is they were built on um, that data coming in at a slower interval that we can now provide. Um, so what we did was we said, well, let's take our source system and then build transformations and refresh those transform enterprise models at a, at a much faster interval than we have in the past. So you just kind of got to figure out like what's right for you and where you want to add that bang for the buck first. Um, another thing that we've realized is, again, people want centralized data access. So while an abstraction like an enterprise model is great, um, some people are going to find new insights on that underlying source data. And so getting that underlying source data out into that same data warehouse is also very valuable. So uh, we went with the approach of take the source systems and rebuild the enterprise models. When you spin out that on warehouses? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and just to be honest, uh, you know, those types of retirements, uh, I think we're shooting for uh, October of next year for our Cloudera retirement. Our Oracle warehouse has. Um, 12-year history. I, I hope it doesn't take 12 years to retire, but I imagine it will take two or three years to fully retire. So uh, yeah, it, it takes a while. Again, if you if commodity prices were higher and we could throw all the people at the world, uh, you know, we might resolve that in 12 months. But if you're doing it largely by yourself and largely based off of what provides the most business value, you're just going to play it out slower over time than, than if you were to do it all at once. So good question. Thank you for your presentation today. Um, you showed a um, slide where you're showing your field data going directly to AWS. Uh, how are you proposing to do that? Are you looking at like a site-to-site -site VPN, or how are you planning on doing that? Yeah, at the networking level, I'm not. Uh, I think we have kind of a local. I think we're doing a couple of things there. I think some of them have like localized uh, wireless networks to um, our field office, and then it goes through there. Uh, and then, you know, we're starting in some of our places that have better wireless connectivity uh, to start, you know, jumping on the cellular networks as well. Now, one of the things that we've realized is that we can, we can bring all that data together, compress it on the device, um, and send a large packet of that data to S3 directly. Again, so like not everything is an IoT core type problem. Um, some of it is just getting the data there for analysis. Uh, and so we can compress that data and then push that data out in a, in a tighter packet uh, and slowly drip it up to S3. So that's another thing we do um, from like the coding side of that problem. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, you, I like how you talked about the platform or the service, the different products rather than building it yourself. It, did you have a lot of challenges with Snowflake or, you know, those type, and when you were picking those packages with, uh, you know, so many to choose from, I just wanted to get your thoughts there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, Snowflake was one of the first technologies where I realized that we would solve more business problems than technology problems. Um, so, you know, we, we started testing it out, looked at performance. Um, the performance was fine. Uh, the implementation uh, has been more about the business strategy of what we're trying to do. 
than the actual technical problems of that technology. And now, one of the things that we had to grow into is, you know, when I tell our security officer that we're going to replicate everything into Snowflake, which is not even really our cloud, it's their cloud, uh, you know, that causes a little bit of head scratching at first. So where I spent a lot of our time was kind of convincing our security architects and our security officer that, you know, that was acceptable and here's what they do from a security approach and solving those problems more than I ever solved the, say, performance problem of Snowflake. Um, and again, because it kind of abstracts us away from, um, you know, scaling up and down warehouses and is dealing with separating out that storage for us, uh, you know, it's, it's been relatively easy from, from that type of standpoint. Uh, it also helps that it has a high correlation with an Oracle Data Warehouse as far as its SQL syntax. Um, so uh, building those transformational queries are, are, you know, something that our existing data warehouse team knew and understood. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Just to add on to his um, previous question of sending data from the field to the cloud, basically. So do you intend to, I don't know whether you're currently doing it or not, do you intend to take directly data from the sensor itself, bypass the historians, or are you still going to send the data from the historians to the cloud? But if you want to do it from the sensors, but as you mentioned, those sensors are 20 years old, they may not have the technologies that, that supports, example, MQTT or something like mm -hmm. that, the newer ones supports it. Yep, yeah, good question. So, uh, like I said, our IoT and ML strategy will evolve for, you know, I'm going to guess about five years, right? So um, our existing SCADA system uh, is still going to be in place for a long time. Now, I, we can hook up these uh, MOXA devices is what we use um, and continue to collect that information in a higher uh, volume than we ever did and do edge-style computing. Uh, but our SCADA system is going to be around. And what's also interesting, and, and it'd be interesting to see, like, how this kind of battle plays out is that our SCADA systems are also evolving. Uh, so we're actually going to try in the next few months um, a newer version of uh, Signet, which is what we use. And they support MQTT. And, and so we'll see how that plays. Now, that won't solve the bandwidth problem that we also have. Um, and we'll see if they ever do anything about you know better edge collection of higher volumes of data. because. They may send us all that data over MQTT, but I'm still only going to be able to pull it at or push it at you know 15 minute intervals based off of the strength of the network. So, uh, you know, you're just going to have to see how that kind of battle plays out. Whether it's better to you know do it your own or whether these providers actually get better at that job um, for us. So we'll just see. It's kind of an area of innovation for us. So uh, we can see some new things, but we will use the old in newer ways as they evolve as well. Right. Uh, I apologize somewhat for the question. I'm with the CME group. Do you guys use, I mean, so this is gonna be a little off topic. Do you guys use uh, futures to kind of, like, like predictive models for, like, you know, here's what the price of oil, the, the, uh, the future prices are to kind of, predict what likely revenues are so you can do better budgeting, that sort of thing? Um, I don't know that we do a lot of like prediction-based um, approaches to commodity prices yet. Um, I mean, we do have a, a robust hedging program, obviously, being an oil and gas company, but um, how much we've actually tried to bring in uh, kind of the market, the historical, and to predict is still a thing I think that we're evolving into. You know, we, someone asked a question about like how comfortable people are with those things. One of the things we discover in the data world is when you get into prediction type scenarios versus um, kind of gut-based scenarios, it takes some time for people that are more used to gut-based decision making to get into accepting of the fact that you could combine all this data into prediction scenarios. So I think that's something that we still have to evolve into over time. Good question. Okay, I got one minute left. Any last question? 
All right. Well, I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you.